Welcome to today's webinar. The topic today is how to integrate artificial intelligence to RFEM using API. My name is Andreas Hörold. I'm responsible for marketing and public relations in the company Luba Software. For instance, the content of the website, the German and English webinars, new features on the website, and so on, newsletters. Yeah. I will be the moderator today and will answer your questions together with Dogu Khan, yeah, but my two colleagues can introduce themselves. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Dogan Karatas and I'm leading the team for API and AI uh, in München. Uh, and today I'm going to reply your questions in the chat. Hi, everyone. Also from my side, my name is uh, Michael Kraus and I'm also part of the team in Munich and I'm an uh, AI specialist and I'm uh, really looking forward to this session with you. Okay. And Michael will do the presentation and we can switch off our webcams that the attendees can see the full screen. Before I hand over the screen to Michael, I would like to introduce you that panel that you can see on the right side of your screen. You can show it with that arrow here and then you can enter a question here yeah, and we will answer you. The other way is to watch the entire webinar and then email your questions to info at global.com. Okay, I hand over the screen to Michael. So let's see what screen you see. I don't know. No, that's not the correct screen, the other one. Okay, that's quite okay. You see the presentation now, right? Okay. Yes. Cool. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward for this uh, session because um, I think we have uh, quite some new stuff to show. And um, yeah, we have some live demos here. Uh, we have some pre-recorded things. And uh, first, we will kick off this um, webinar with uh, some words about the web services and the API, which is the foundation for all what will be then the main part of that presentation concerning um, artificial intelligence, machine and deep learning and how we in Global are going to use that or you can already use that uh, in some parts. Um, yeah, for that we will uh, get a bit of a background on AI, like what is that so that everyone is on the same page when we dive into a bit more technical depth uh, when it comes to using AI for um, optimization of your structures. And then we will um, highlight some of the upcoming features in the global universe, which is a help chatbot. Uh, we will have uh, some ex um, yeah, experience with the text to model. And then I will quickly tell about future plans, what we are going to release during the next year. Um, yeah, as already said, uh, feel free to answer uh, or post some questions. We're happy to answer that. And um, yeah, let's uh, jump right in into um, the API and web services. Um, as far as I know, there have been some uh, webinars already concerned with uh, what web services are. I think uh, Dogu Khan presented that very nicely to all of you. Um, I will just take the a chance here to summarize the main points. So what is an API? Um, in short terms, API stands for Application Programming Interface. And uh, this is a set of rules and protocols mainly for software programs uh, in order to be able to communicate with uh, each other. So uh, it essentially acts as a messenger um, facilitating the exchange of information between different uh, programs or services. Um, by receiving some requests and translating them and returning responses, um, it enables the smooth transfer of data and functionality between different systems. And uh, if you want to consider that a bit more plastic, um, consider just a simple GUI or graphic user interface that also serves as a communication protocol, but this time between humans and software programs. So in simple terms, a GUI and with a GUI, 
you can just interact with a program using buttons, menus, and other input methods. And in that same way, an API allows software programs to interact with each other and providing a standard set uh, of rules and protocols for communication. So that was a bit more of an abstract uh, intro. And now let's say you want to use that for RFM. And uh, with that uh, RFM interface, you can give the program commands uh, using buttons and inputs. And with the API, you could similarly enable the communication between one software program and the other, like VS Code, which I'm using uh, with Python to do that. And you will see that um, a lot uh, in this uh, webinar today. Yeah, so an API is, is basically a, a communication interface. And now what is uh, web services? Um, yeah, simply web services are a type of uh, application programming interface, API again, that uh, distinguishes itself from other types of APIs based on their style and way of uh, communication. Um, web uh, services fa facilitate the XML-based information exchange between systems. Uh, here in our case, in the global universe, uh, we use an HTTP technology called Simple Object Access Protocol or SOAP in abbreviation um, to establish this connection, uh, which provides a standardized method for accessing our web services. And in the past, and I think that was uh, mainly with uh, Dogokan and the team, uh, they developed frameworks that enabled the use of these connections in structural analysis and design because they provide basic functions that allow the users to send commands to FM and receive uh, the responses from that. Yeah, having said that, um, feel free to browse into our GitHub uh, repository. Uh, there you will find all the uh, things what I just said and you can play around and uh, code along. And yeah, um, I really can just uh, invite you to have a look at these facilities. They're great. And as I said before, um, this is really the basis of um, what is going to be shown uh, in the AI part of that session. <clears throat> so still, I want to take the chance here to um, display um, the functionality. So in the best case, you should now see in the screen uh, a programming code on the right-hand side and the RFM uh, GUI on the left-hand side. Um, Dogokan or Andreas, can you quickly tell me if that's going to be seen or not? Yes, yes, this is the right screen. Yes, okay, cool. So um, yeah, let's uh, quickly dive a bit into that example. So as I said, the um, web services and the um, API, uh, they can be used to communicate with, uh, with RFM, right? And this time we are not using our mouse, uh, the graphical user interface only. No, uh, this time we are using uh, code uh, to exchange information back and forth. And uh, to quickly summarize a bit that script, the little thing which I brought to you, uh, that is about a cantilever beam under a point load. And I will walk you a bit through that piece of code. So as ever in programming, we first have to load some libraries here, mainly functionalities from FM. So we need some uh, basic objects to establish nodes and so forth. And then we want to have some load cases. And finally, we want to collect some results. So this example here, the situation is that we have a list of sections here that is three um, IPE profiles, uh, which we want to compute under a certain load. So we define this section list that can be shorter, that can be longer, depending a bit on your specific application case. And then we um, set the modification of the model to true and call that model just a steel column. And we initiate and instantiate a result dict, which is empty in the beginning. And then we want to compute these three sections here in a for loop, as you can see. 
So um, the first thing to do is let's define some nodes. So we have a first node here, which is at the origin uh, in X, Y, and Z is equal to zero. And then we have a five meter long um, column in that case. We want to assign a material. Here it's a simple steel S235. And uh, this material here is assigned via this text and a material number. Then we are going to define a section. Uh, in that case here, as it is very simple, we only have one section. So we give it the number one. And for the name of that section, we define it per this list and the actual counter in the for loop. So having the nodes and the material in the section, now we can define a member, as you can see here, uh, all the attributes and Finally, in order to make it a feasible structural system, we need to give a nodal support. Here we just would clamp it at the first node. Then we can uh, jump right in into the load case definition. Um, here we define a load case uh, one, we exclude a self weight uh, here, and then we put a nodal force onto um, a second uh, node and the direction uh, of global C with three kilonewtons. Then we execute the computation and save the results from uh, the um, FM computation, delete the model and go into the next counter. Having done this for loop, we collect the results and just dump it into a JSON. Uh, here you can also save it into pandas format or CSV. Um, as you like. But let's leave it for the moment and just give it a try. So I will start that, um, that script. So you see here it connects to the web service uh, server. Um, hopefully uh, it should now start to modify a model here. Yes, it works. Very good. And uh, as I said, so it will take the first section from that list, create a model, apply the loads, do the computation and save the results to this uh, dict. And uh, after the three computations have been made, um, we will hopefully see here this resulting JSON file. Yeah. And if you look a bit closer here, you can see that it uh, actually is uh, changing. Uh, so we are at the moment in the second, second run. And then hopefully we should see the IP 600. Yes, we do. And we are done with that computation. Yeah, and we are saving the displacement at uh, the tip uh, in uh, meters. And you can see here, okay, finally, we really got out uh, these um, results here. And we can now go further and do maybe some other um, analysis with that things. Yeah, I hope uh, the workflow here got uh, clear. Um, as I said, uh, if you have uh, more interest in learning about the web services and how to use the API in maybe more complicated situations, feel free to uh, check our other webinars, the recordings of that, or just put some uh, questions into the chat box uh, because uh, Dogokan and Andreas are happy to answer those. Yeah, um, as you can imagine, um, we have now a big source of uh, data or we can generate a lot of data which yeah the next step would be a can we use somehow ai in the widest sense for that so uh, at lubel we had uh, the idea of diving more into that realm and uh, identify the useful cases of machine and deep learning for structural engineering because there is yeah, I would say a big hype at the moment about AI and uh, a lot of times in the media, you potentially see uh, these, what I call expectations here, like uh, robots uh, working with a computer on fancy stuff and graphics. But in reality, if the one or the other uh, person in the audience already had to do with uh, AI in the widest sense, uh, they know that uh, in reality, it is a lot of working 
with code and uh, except you are a robot specialist, uh, you will not really work with robots if you deal with AI. So the reality is that uh, AI means a lot of coding and how to work with data. And uh, that is why I wanted to stress a bit also the history of AI because what we are seeing at the moment, it's not the first hype in AI. It's uh, actually, I think, the third or the fourth uh, AI wave um, because AI in theory or in the sciences is a uh, really old topic. So it began in the Second World War uh, with uh, some famous mathematicians uh, in Great Britain. They already started to think about uh, machines which can uh, execute things on their own or reason about data. And uh, over time, so there were some winters, AI winters, uh, where some of the AI hypes uh, broke down again. And uh, it was really a, in the 80s, I think, were these terms, machine learning and deep learning, which is uh, more um, yeah, applicable in the engineering sciences, uh, where they came up. And yeah, so in, in AI in general, you deal with uh, different kinds of uh, software and programs. Uh, they can be symbolic, they can be data-driven. And uh, this time we want to focus more on the data-driven side of AI. And uh, this is more machine learning. And recently, since the last decade, uh, especially it's deep learning. Yeah, um, for your information, or maybe you know that, um, algorithms like neural networks, they have been like known even in the 90s or in the 80s, uh, people did not simply have the computational power to train them or train bigger networks. So I think uh, what we have seen in the last decade in all these um, yeah, AI breakthroughs, I would call them, uh, that I think is mainly as we have computational power in our days at uh, a certain amount of cost, which a lot of people can afford, and we have computers being fast enough to do all these computations and handle uh, big amounts of data and we can store them uh, in a cheap way. So I think there is a good chance that uh, nowadays we don't see this AI boom dying again as it happened in the past, as I said, two or three times. And uh, therefore I think it absolutely makes sense as uh, civil engineers or engineers or people <laughs> in general to dive a bit into what that uh, AI thing is. <clears throat> so I think it is important in a, in a technical environment to reason if we should use AI or not, because in the technical sciences, we have a lot of models and the question always is, or in the business, the question always is, why would you use another model if you have already some and they do a job? So uh, if we want to use AI, you have to always uh, check three things. So the first is, do you have data about the problem? Do these data contain the pattern you're trying to model? And is there not a simpler model which does the job? Yeah, if you can say yes to all of the three, then uh, you're lucky and you can apply AI, or at least there's a high chance of uh, being successful in applying some kind of, of AI method. Uh, what you see here is, why would you in this AI boom still need domain experts like civil engineers? And I think the reason is because just people from the domain, like from civil engineering, yeah, they can judge these three things. Like if the data is correct, if there is no simpler model, and if the data have or contain that pattern. So yeah, I think that in the future we will see more and more applications of AI within the domain, but they can never be. Um, developed without the input of the community. So that's another thing why I think we from the domain as civil engineers or architects should engage uh, with these kind of, of methods. Yeah, I don't want to do too much of a lecture um, today. I just wanted to give you an overview of the nomenclature because uh, a lot of people talk about AI when this term does not mean really much. Um, so if you want to be a bit more specific and especially at Lubal, we uh, want to yeah, come up with um, uh, software and programs uh, which help you. Uh, therefore, we wanted to establish a kind of uh, nomenclature so that everyone speaks the same language. So let's start with machine learning, which is the older uh, family of AI methods. And uh, machine learning would be 
yeah, distinguished into two main categories of algorithms. And uh, the distinguishing factor of the algorithms is the data you have. And uh, depending now on the nature of the data, um, they would be then called supervised machine learning algorithms or unsupervised. So let's start with supervised machine learning because I think a lot of you uh, during their studies have already been in touch with regression problems. And uh, yeah, that's uh, really whoever did uh, higher mathematics or something in that direction or statistics, you have basically seen some basic machine learning algorithms uh, if you ever did polynomial fitting or so. And um, yeah, machine learning offers a wider range of algorithms, but at least you understood the basic uh, concepts of that. So let's start with that uh, regression example to clarify a bit what I meant with sorted or marked data. So sorted or marked data mean that, for example, I have some input, which is typically called X. And for each of the inputs, I also have an answer or a target Y, right? So my data set consists of inputs X, which I hand to that function or model. And then this model can predict me something. And I compare this prediction with an actual target or my label or mark in the data set. Okay, so I hope this uh, clarifies that a bit. And the difference between regression and classification is just the nature, the data type of the targets of the Y variable. So if you have a Y variable, which is continuous, that's regression. And if it is a discrete thing, uh, then it's classification as you can think of, hey, if I have maybe images, that would be my input. And I have a label, which is a dog or a pig or an ape here. Um, yeah. The, the labels dog and pig and ape, that would be the marks or the labels, okay? So I think we settled the supervised learning a bit. And if you don't have these labels, uh, for example, you just have a lot of images, but you don't have uh, a label for each of the images, you still can do um, machine learning here. That would be called the family of unsupervised um, algorithms as we don't have access to a label. And typical things in data mining is, is just clustering, right? So give me a bunch of images or texts or models which have some similarities, but I would not know from the algorithm that these kind of uh, data is, is docs. It would just tell me, hey, here, this bunch of, of data that looks similar to the algorithm. So you have to feed that maybe then to a human to interpret uh, the clusters. Another big thing is dimensionality reduction. Um, I think most of you know um, compressing images. Yeah, that's the same idea. So whenever we can get rid of, uh, of data representation features, uh, we use dimensionality reduction to compress, so to say, the data to its main um, features, which is usually the, the direction of the data with the highest variance here. And then there is some association, uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, for example, in recommender systems and, and things. And yeah, I would leave it here with the machine learning. As I said, uh, if you have uh, in your education already um, got into contact with linear regression, you basically understood uh, some of the concepts of machine learning. And now you can imagine that for the different situations what we have just looked at, for example, classification, regression, and clustering, there is a whole bunch of models which we can apply our data to. In order to not overcomplicate it, and as I said, I don't want to give a scientific lecture today, uh, I just brought this example because we will look at it from the machine learning, but also the deep learning perspective. And what I want you now is to imagine that we have a, a problem at hand, which has two input dimensions. I just called them X1 and X2. So that could be a length, that could be a profile, uh, whatever. <clears throat> and I want you to understand that our target, our Y, that's a, a bit of a nonlinear problem. So some of our data lives here. Maybe that's uh, columns which are buckling and maybe that's columns which are not buckling, for example. And now we want to find a model which can describe given our inputs, 
a prediction of of our targets of our why. Yeah, and uh, I used the decision tree here classifier to distinguish if that thing uh, will be in this class or in that class, given that nonlinear input space. And you see that there is yeah this uh, rough um, capturing of that circle. Uh, I still could play a bit around with that. But the point is that in AI, usually machine learning is a bit restricted in terms of expressivity because there are the simpler form of algorithms and the more powerful form of algorithms are neural networks. And that's where the big breakthroughs, I think, came into place in the last decade, uh, especially in computer vision, meaning working with images, videos, uh, natural language, and so forth. So uh, I want you to understand at least um, the, the basic parts of uh, deep learning. So as I said, deep learning historically was a, a part of machine learning because we deal with a very specific kind of model, which is the neural networks, what you can see here. And uh, meanwhile, it uh, got so famous or a lot of people worked in it uh, so that it is uh, at the moment considered an independent field of science within AI. Yeah, um, what is a neural network? <clears throat> Again, we would have some input layers. That is where you feed your data into. That can be images, that can be text, that can be videos, that can be yeah, a lot of, of uh, data formats, what you can think of. And then we have that layers in between here. They are called the hidden layers because I mean, you can look into them uh, via your code, but uh, usually people would not know necessarily what has been learned inside it. And then what you can uh, see as a human, again, that's the output layer, and that is where our yeah output of the model of the network comes out. As I said, that can be an image, that can be a text, that can be your structural global model, and the output then could be yeah, any data type you want can be also an image, can be also a text, can be also a global model. And here you see again the differentiation between supervised and unsupervised learning. So when we have access to true labels or true uh, marks, then we can do supervised learning because we can formulate this loss between the model prediction and the ground truth data what we have and neural networks here they are trained so these layers are trained meaning the numerical values between uh, these nodes here they change depending on how well our model can reproduce uh, the training data what we gave i hope you uh, at least got some some glimpse into what neural networks are and as i said that is really a big big field at the moment there is different models uh, which uh, everyone uses so the students in the university would maybe look more into these simple things uh, there is things which can carry some time dependency uh, there is generative things for example everyone knows uh, ChatGPT or so yeah they are based on 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 some of uh, the more um yeah uh, complicated neural network uh, models, or if you work with images, you have maybe come across convolutional networks um, and so forth. Yeah, so for the ones interested, look at this. I think that's a very nice introductory page on, uh, on neural networks. It's called Neural Network Zoo because uh, it's like in the zoo, you go around and you, uh, so to say, discover different animals, different neural networks. And uh, as a start, I think that's, that's very nice. Okay. Um, I think very yeah, last things into theory, um, again, about the training. So I think it's important that you understand for um, training AI, we need some data, right? So um, we have some inputs and maybe some outputs, and now we want to find a relation between those two. And we want this relation to be modeled mathematically or in the software with a neural network. So that's just, a, I would say, more complicated formula. And uh, typically what you will see here is uh, these so-called loss curves. That means how well your prediction of the model um, compares to the ground truth data. And uh, typically you will see this drop in the loss. So that means the model is getting better and better and better at predicting uh, several 
data instances in your data set. So it does a good predictive job, so to say. Yeah. Um, usually, if you put more layers into the network, it, it is uh, being more powerful, meaning it can be trained um, better. And uh, let's uh, dive again into our example. So you remembered with uh, the machine learning approach, we tried to find the decision boundary or model these two data sets here. And uh, what I wanted to show here is if you take a very, very, very simple neural network, I think that's even worse than the machine learning model. So we would dismiss that totally as well. But if you go a bit up in complexity, we will see that now this model is able to capture the circular structure of that problem and even captures nicely these two um, surfaces here. And we see that immediately in the loss, right? So if you look here, so that would be the solid lines would be the first model. So even after some training steps, like 500 epochs of training, that would have a significant error still, and you can see it visually here. And the second network, that has a really uh, increase in, in this drop of, of the loss. And we could say that uh, this already learned something very acceptable. Yeah, I did not play uh, around a lot with that uh, pedagogic example here because I want to leave it with the theory. And uh, yeah, if you feel that you have questions on that, feel free to, to write to us. We're going to yeah maybe also consider to write a textbook on that and how we apply these things in global but that will be stuff for next year yeah closing remark on the deep learning side um, as i said <clears throat> the main difference in deep learning and machine learning is that in machine learning you as the human expert the human modeler you're coming up with the description of the problem meaning you're defining what is x1 x2 and so forth and in deep learning, you can leave that totally to the neural network. And uh, especially for uh, images or videos or text, uh, creating, so to say, a coordinate system of how to describe that properly. I think it's uh, very hard. Uh, you as a human have, have a very hard uh, time to do. And I think that's really where deep learning shines. So extracting features like descriptions of that uh, that image so that in the end you can reach that uh, prediction if, for example, the input is a car or not. Yeah. Deep learning comes with a downside. As we get rid of that feature extraction step, you need more data, right? Uh, in comparison to machine learning, where you can have as little as 100 or so um, data points to train a sensible machine learning algorithm, in deep learning, it's way more complicated. So usually, if you don't have other regularizers like differential equations, uh, you need simply more and more data because these feature extraction steps that will happen in the first layers of the network. And you can look into that, for example, in the ImageNet, um, there is some visualizations what these kind of networks have learned. For example, in the first layers, you will recognize that it has learned that the car is composed of tires or circles and so. Good, so far for the theory. And now let's connect um, back to our domain, to the structural engineering. Um, as I said, uh, since beginning of that year, we had that hype in, uh, especially I think, ChatGPT and Delhi, uh, which both come from OpenAI. And uh, these kind of models, like the transformer models, which ChatGPT or the GPT stands for, um, they have been around even before OpenAI, but I think OpenAI managed something very uh, nice. They brought a new interface to these GPT models, right? because now they provided us a web interface and that's a bit similar to our uh, web services idea, bringing in a new interface and then people can interact in new forms with existing software. So I did the following. I said like, hey, if we have these powerful uh, transformer models behind that, uh, that, um, yeah, that company, um, yeah, can we use that to do something meaningful in our domain, like in civil engineering? And I just asked Delhi to construct me a sustainable concrete bridge over a river. And you can look what it came up with. So that is two, just two examples out of some. And if we look to the right, I mean, I'm from uh, here, the Munich area, or at least uh, Germany, 
So for me as a civil engineer, that I think is more of a US style uh, in, in designing a bridge. So I think in, in Europe, you will not see these kind of hat here and stuff. Uh, but more severely, as a civil engineer, you would ask yourself, why the hell is there a column in the middle of that span? Uh, on the other hand, if you look a bit uh, to the right-hand side, which I think is a more spectacular uh, bridge, uh, I can barely find concrete, or at least I imagine this to be steel, or I hope that is steel. But uh, these hangers here, they just end in over and also that thing here goes into the bushes. So uh, my take is, okay, it's a nice start. So meaningful to some extent, but uh, we as engineers should now start to contribute to that stuff. And you may remember my circle uh, with the scientific machine learning. I think that's especially what we should do. Um, yeah, so for the strategy in Lubal, um, we could ask ourselves, like, why would we as civil engineers use machine and deep learning at all? And uh, we said, okay, uh, I think it makes sense to use machine and deep learning if we have just empirical models anyway, so there is no like differential equation like the background of the finite element method, uh, or if you want to describe uh, newer materials where we know that uh, physics-based models maybe are incomplete or not uh, fitting the experimental data very well. Uh, our design problem, that can be a length, that can be a section profile, that can be a material. And what we usually not know is this um, greenish um, surface. And the idea is that all of your structural models, for example, a bridge or a house or a truss, they, they live all on this parametric manifold. So if I change the cross sections of, of that uh, cantilever, what we looked at, I would go along these lines here, right, on that surface. And what with FEM we do at the moment, we shoot at this um, surface, so to say, at single points. So whenever you do a structural analysis, you fix an input space and then evaluate maybe one or two points on that surface. But maybe you want to learn the whole surface and then that would be called surrogate modeling and then we can speed up uh, optimization and analysis. Yeah, and that's uh, the reason why uh, Lubal went into their um, offices and came up with a uh, first optimization tool uh, that is based on the particle swarm optimizer. And I brought you that little figure here on the right hand side. So, uh, particle swarm optimizers are um, yeah, specifically suitable for solving extremely difficult or impossibly numeric optimization problems. Uh, can have uh, multiple maxima or minima and things. And uh, yeah, the update of that particles in their um, state variables, which is the position and the velocity, um, they are mimicking or these update equations come from social behavior modeling, right? So they were inherited from there. And uh, Luval went into their offices and programmed this particle swarm optimizer for structural applications. So um, there is a whole set of, of webinars, so I will spare a bit the, the time here um, to go further into detail. I just wanted to tell you, hey, in the background of that, we have worked on particular swarm optimizers and how we can use them uh, within the global uh, software families to allow for optimization under uh, multiple minima and maxima. And uh, yeah, I think Dogokan will provide you the link to the other webinars. Uh, feel free to have a look if you want to optimize uh, your structures with that technique. Yeah, there is an upcoming tool a development, as I said. So, so far the particle swarm optimizer does the following for you. So it samples a lot of these inputs and yeah, tries to find the local minimum here at the surface with that particular swarm optimizer. Uh, what we are going to provide to you is uh, what's called an inverse design, meaning that you can request performances. For example, you want to limit your deflections to 100 millimeters and maybe a first eigenfrequency to some domain and maybe restrict some of the materials. And then this generative model will provide you the respective design features, what you would have 
to have used to come up with these criteria here. So that's not possible at the moment with uh, any standard uh, solver like finite element method. So we went into our lab and uh, did that um, to, to come up with a solution. And I brought you a little video here. And what we do here is uh, we use again the web services. So um, we define again here a concrete column uh, which has a length of five meter and some loading like dead load and life load. And we request here some uh, um, utilizations in the limit states of serviceability, but also um, uh, ultimate limit state. And then we have this uh, generative neural network, uh, which you will see in a minute. So you hand over these requests to, to that, as you can see here, and then it will generate, and you saw that this really quick, uh, a set of options, what you have in order to fulfill these criteria, what you want to have, right? So now you can choose out of this uh, set of options. Uh, I think I will choose here. Yes, the first one, because that has the highest utilization here. Uh, here you can check. Okay, we take a concrete C3037 with uh, uh, 30 centimeter square a rectangle uh, cross section. And with that material and uh, section choice, we go and compute the FEM model, because in the end, I think we want to show that this AI prediction uh, really holds true what we have requested and we need to yeah, prove to uh, maybe a checking engineer or so that uh, these results are correct and uh, we want to have maybe the um, the, the FM protocol. So uh, what we do here is set up this analysis again as we did with, uh, with the introductory um, video, uh, define the section, the loads, and compute that and do the concrete analysis here. Yeah, and uh, in a second, you will see that script um, running. So very similar to what I've shown you in the beginning. And in addition, here we have this inverse uh, generative deep learning or neural network model to come up with design suggestions uh, for your requested performances. Here it is utilizations in the SLS and ULS. Yeah. And yeah, I will show you if that uh, computation is done. Uh, the actual result here. So we wanted it to be uh, utilized in the range of 50 to 100%. And yeah, let's hope that this is the outcome. Go to the concrete. Yeah, you will see here. So it's 76% utilized. So it's a suitable um, cross section, which we can use for, for the analysis. Yeah, so that's the future of our optimization tool. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to hit the chat box. Yeah, another thing which uh, DogoCon already showed, I think in, in some of our prior um, speaking engagements is the chatbot, the help chatbot. So that will be a generative uh, AI model, which uh, is uh, producing some text, uh, which you can uh, yeah, chat with. So it's an intelligent uh, manual, so to say, or an intelligent uh, service, what we have here. And how that works, I will demonstrate here. Um, it's uh, uh, yeah, based also on the KPT technology. Uh, in the back end and uh, for example i can ask uh, this thing more of marketing now uh, what fm6 is and uh, yeah it will provide you some arguments for using um, rfm6 um, i think that's that's nice because as i said uh, that's a generative algorithm so it really will chat with you uh, using uh, language it's uh, having capabilities to talk in uh, German, in English, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and all the major languages. Uh, we have trained that chatbot in our FAQ, knowledge base and manual data. And as I said, that will be used on the websites and within the programs. So let's now see if that uh, chatbot could also help us with a more uh, specific technical question. Now this time I want uh, the program to answer me or help me if I want to do uh, torsional buckling, buckling um, analysis. Um, 
the ones you are familiar with the Lubal um, products, uh, you would know you can do that, for example, yes, with the uh, EC3 module. Um, and yeah, you will find the answer here. So I think that's, um, that's correct. And the, the nice feature of that chatbot is, or we intended to, to have a nice feature here, which is uh, that it will provide you also a reference and an internet source, uh, which you can just click as you can see here. So that will be an interactive um, capability here so that you get the support in due time uh, that, that you can really work with that. Yeah, <clears throat> being in uh, generative uh, natural language processing, we have another project which is uh, entity recognition for a text to model interface. Um, that is, uh, or the idea is the following. So within the chatbot or maybe in another window, uh, you are allowed to input uh, natural uh, text. Uh, that can be, for example, a command that our text to model interface should generate a six meter long steel column with a certain material and a certain section from the origin, for example, and entity recognition then collects the main features and maps it to our um, FM code or this uh, web services code and how that can work. So this time uh, we played a bit around with, uh, with a local service uh, not integrated in the RFM, but uh, as an extra standing service. Uh, yeah, time will show what the final layout of that will be. But uh, yeah, just that you get uh, an impression for that. So the idea is that you can prompt, so to say, uh, the, the creation of, of that model. And then via the web services in the back end, you will see that uh, the API interacts with, uh, with FM, and then this model is created um, here. You can change that also on the fly if you have decided to model a different thing. So you can just submit your uh, next prompt and then we'll via web services um, just um, update the model. So yeah, coming to the end um, of, uh, of my presentation of the webinar, um, I just want to highlight some of the strategy what we are currently working on and we try to release in yeah, the next uh, 12 months, so to say. So we are planning to release this uh, chatbot maybe by end of this year, beginning of next year, and then step after step, we will um, release these uh, text interfaces and also the optimization tools. And in the future, it's also planned to have other modalities, uh, not just uh, text, but also maybe um, audio so that you can uh, write and really talk uh, with uh, your global structural models. Yeah, with that, I, I really thank you for joining in today. I'm sorry for uh, being gone for a minute or so. Um, did not realize that really. And uh, yeah, I would hand over back to um, Andreas now for the rest of the of the webinar. Thank you. Okay, Michael, thanks you. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah, we had some yeah you know, disturbing disturbing noises in your voice. Uh, maybe the microphone or the connection to the go to webinar server was was a little bit bad, but yeah, we could understand you. Okay, before I would like to show you where you can find the recording and the slides, I would like to show you one slide in our presentation. If you have questions to our products, uh, such as web services and API, or you would like to get your free product demonstration, of RFM, RSTAP, any add-on such as, as web service and so on, just contact our sales team. You can click on that link or can scan that QR code. You can also get the non-binding offer as you want. Yeah, yeah, Just contact our colleagues. So then I show you the website, bluebar.com and under news and events, you can find our webinars.
So where's the webinar of today? Those are the scheduled webinars for the next weeks. I click on today's webinar. You will also get an email when the recording is online with a direct link to that page. And then you will find the recording in the middle here. And you can already download the PowerPoint slides as a PDF file. Okay, that's also all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to Michael for the nice presentation. Thanks to Dogel Khan for the help by, with answering the questions. Now, I wish you all a nice rest of the day. A Merry Christmas. If you don't meet each other in a webinar until Christmas. Yeah, and bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.